Yeah. So you, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. I yeah, appreciate it. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you guys. And um, welcome to Alaska, Tim. I never, I never in my wildest dreams thought I'm going to go to Alaska. And I never thought I'd go to Alaska with a bunch of church people, right? So um, I'm just so excited to be here. It's my third time up in Alaska, and it definitely won't be my last. So thanks for coming out tonight. And um, Ed and Carol, thanks again for your home. And Josh, good to see you. Got some teenagers here. If teenagers show up, that's a good thing, right? Hey, what's going on, bud? Ethan. Is it Ethan? All right, welcome, guys. Good to see you guys. I see, see some of my... I got some friends here from the, the re retreat that we work at up north by Talkeetna. And, um, so, guys, tonight's going to be super informal, okay? So, um, I want to encourage if there's, like, questions as we go along or any kind of clarification... Um, let's just keep this as like informal as possible and have a good night tonight, okay? So um, so we're going to talk about a, a, a subject, I call it stress in the storm, Jesus the calm. And when the pandemic started a couple years ago, I thought, because I, I used to fly everywhere, I do these weekends everywhere around the world, did a lot of that work. When the pandemic started, I thought, well, there, there that goes. I guess I'll just hibernate for a year or two or something. But what happened was... I started getting phone calls and emails from churches all over the world, like, Tim, help us out. We don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, I can't fly out there anymore. <laughs> we'll just get on Zoom, you know, and what's, what's Zoom? So I did Zoom, and, and the thing just exploded. This was one of the first things I did was stress in the storm, like, what's going on right now? So tonight I want to talk about, um, it's kind of an approach to anxiety and depression, it can really be applied to a lot of different maladies in our life. But I kind of focus in on anxiety especially because that's like 80% of all mental health diagnoses is anxiety. So I'm kind of focusing on that. But if you've got something else going on, maybe you're a, you have a relative that struggles with this kind of uh, diagnosis. Oh, little baby. <sighs> um, maybe you've just got friends at work. Maybe you don't have, you know, too much going on in your own life, but certainly we have friends, right? We have people in church that we sit next to. This is good information for any of us. But before we go any further, i got to introduce you to my family. Um, I just said, you know, God puts us in family, right? And it's so, uh, to me, it's just such an encouraging thing that God gives us. So that's my son-in-law, Adrian Danielle. They just got back from China. They've been on the mission team for like nine years over there. My son, Tim, and little Ranger, he's a rescue dog from China, <laughs> little Ranger, and that's my wife, Jackie, but I really did this just so I could see another picture of my granddaughter. That's, that's little Elsa. She just reminds me of the creativity of God. She loves to put <laughs> stickers on herself. She likes to paint her face with markers. She's just the joy of my life. So anyways, bye, Elsa. Um, if, if you want to go to my website, um, I've got a, a website that has my books on it and stuff. You can sign up for a, um, like a monthly blog that I send out. My passion in life right now, guys, is, um, is mental health in the church setting. That's my passion. That's what I care the most about. And that's what I write about is how do we do this stuff in a church environment? I believe churches are like the perfect place for healing. I really do. I don't think they're the only place to get better. There's a lot of places to get better. But I do think churches offer an ideal place. There's just so much that we are in church that lends itself to getting better. So I write a lot about that. That's my passion in life. Is um, And you can sign up for free blogs. I just hired this marketing guy. He's amazing. He's a little goofy. His hair sticks up on the end sometimes. Named Shane Engel, but uh, but Shane has just revamped the way I, I do my I, my work. So, anyways, InMotionCounseling.org. So let's get started here. So you guys know what's going on, right? Like, if you're past the age of 25 or 30, you know this world has changed. It's changed dramatically. What we've been through is unprecedented. No matter where we stand on the whole COVID thing and 
you know, how we handle that as a country and all that. It's unprecedented what's happened to us, okay? We shut the thing down for two years. Uh, we had a million people die from this thing. I lost some dear friends. Um, our world has changed dramatic because of COVID. Um, but along with that, um, trauma has become a big thing now. Like people are getting aware of their trauma in life. We didn't used to do this stuff. In, in uh, the psychological uh, areas right now, trauma is like the big buzzword. Mm -hmm. It's what we're doing a lot of research on. Um, Shane and I have a friend, Kyle Spears, that specializes in this area. A lot of us are framing our lives around traumatic events in our life. So that's gone on. Um, mental health diagnoses are through the roof, right? There's estimates like uh, about half of all adults will struggle, will be diagnosed with uh, mental health diagnoses in the next 20 years or so. Like it's huge. Back in the day it was pretty minimal. You do some people. Divisions in our country, very stressful. The racial divisions, the, um, the political divisiveness is just unprecedented again. And it's gotten to the point, guys, in our churches where there's some people I struggle talking to. And there's people that struggle talking to me. <laughs> they do. Like, I, I, I own that because of how divisive we become. I don't think we're ready for 2024. Mm. I just don't. Mm. I, I fear for my country in that way because of how divisive we become. And then just regular stress, right? So we all have our jobs. We have kids. We have retirement accounts. We just live in a stressful place. So I think what I want to share tonight, I think, can help us frame some of this stuff. Now, if you, if you have a mental health diagnosis or something right now and you're taking medication, please continue to do so. If you're seeing a private counselor, please continue to do that as well. What I share tonight doesn't replace any of that. It's simply to help you frame, maybe better framed, what you're struggling with or what your friends are struggling with. But please don't take what I say. It's like, oh, I'm going to go do this and I'm going to buy that book. And, you know, please continue to do what you've been doing. And then, of course, we want to help others, right? That's another thing is just, I tell people, if you're not struggling with this stuff, look, look to the person next to you and say, how, how can I help you out? Like, this stuff isolates us. So, um, so that's kind of the setup here. Now, the cool thing is God understands us, right? God's not up in heaven going, oh, my gosh, what's happened to these people? Like, I don't know what to do now. I better invent some new medications. Like, I'm scrambling. God's not like that. God totally has this under control. Um, Psalm 139 is a great one. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Like God's, God's in charge. He doesn't get caught unaware. Now, I can't explain God. <laughs> I'm not sure what he's up to. I don't have that. I'm not privy to all that knowledge. As you and I all know, like things happen that we just don't get to explain. But God is in charge. He understands us as humans. Okay? So I'm just kind of setting things up for us right now. So the first thing I want to share with you is there's a human need for anxiety and depression. We, we, we sometimes frame anxiety and depression around um, bad. Like it's all boogeyman. It's all really bad stuff. But actually there's a human need for it. In other words, God developed us as humans with a need for anxiety in our life. And a need for depression. I'll explain that to you. Anxiety is a God-given um, phenomenon in our brain to keep us protected. So one night I was up at uh, Estes Park in Colorado, and I was teaching classes, and I started walking back to my cabin at like 10 p.m. And I, I was walking behind these cabins, and all of a sudden I remembered this sign I saw. It said, beware, bears in the area. I'm like, oh shoot, here I am, 10 o'clock. I'm just wandering behind cabins. And the back of my neck started crawling. The hair started tingling. And uh, I thought, and I didn't see a bear, just to let you know. But that was my brain getting me ready to run or to fight, you know. God gives us a, 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 a yeah. Or <laughs> let, me ref let me rephrase that to lose a fight, right? Kind of like when I played hockey, I never fought much, but when I did fight, I always lost. So, um, but it's like a safety thing. You're driving down the interstate and you see a big truck running a red light, 
and you don't stop and go to your brain and go, huh, what should I do in this situation? I always heard turning left helps. Maybe I should hit the brakes, right? You don't do that. Your brain automatically goes in to overdrive and you hit the brakes, you turn left hard, right? It's a safety feature, so we all need um, our anxiety, our anxious brain is what I call it. We need that in order to live. Um, humility. You know, this is a thing with, uh, I've learned from my own life personally. I'm going to confess something here. I'm kind of ashamed to tell you this, but um, when my mother was dying of cancer about 15 years ago, I got in the back seat of her car and I had a panic attack. My first time I ever had a panic attack. I didn't know what they were. It just, I started kicking, I was in the back seat of a little sports car, I started kicking the seat in front of me to get out. And um, it was my first panic attack. And I realize I've got anxiety. Like I had to go see the doctor. What I'm ashamed of is not that. I'm ashamed that I used to judge people like that. Mm -hmm. I used to think, as a counselor, like for people that were depressed, I think like, come on, what do you got to be depressed about? I'd think that I would never say it. But I thought that. When I had my first panic attack, it humbled me. It, I realized I am not in charge all the time. That was a hard thing for a 40-year-old guy who was always in charge to realize. Like, I'm not in charge of my life all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't have the power that I always thought I had. And it humbled me, and it was a good thing for me. It was a good thing to realize, Tim, you're a pretty weak person. And I started bonding and connecting to people like I'd never done before. Because I realized my own weakness, and it just helped me to connect to other people. So there's a phenomenon on anxiety and depression that humbles us in a really good way. God's not trying to like knock us down and push us down, but he does remind us that, you know, you are but dust. Like, we've got to re realize that. And then finally, um, it's an opportunity for growth and reflection. So depression's a wonderful phenomenon in our lives for, it's the opportunity sometimes to, to pull back on life, and go inside and see what's going on. Like what's, uh, Psalm 42, I think I'm going to have that come up. There's a Psalm 42 where it says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so distraught within me? God models for us this idea of going inside and checking out the soul. That's what depression does for us. Actually, depression is a great uh, feature of lives for people that are creative. You ever notice that? Like, you ever notice why songs, uh, singers and artists, their suicide rates are way higher? It's because they tend to be melancholic people as a personality. And the reason they're good creative-wise is because they go deep inside. They're able to go inside their soul in ways that most of us can't. Now, the downside is sometimes they, they overdo that, right? But, um, but we need depression. We need the, the ability to go look inside of ourselves. Now, obviously, what happens, though, is we overdo this stuff, right? So we overdo depression and anxiety, so to speak. In other words, we, for different reasons, we don't have limits on it or boundaries on it the way we should. And we can overdo it. So there are challenges and dangers to it. We all know this. Anxiety and depression, higher rates of self-harm. You know, when, when you have a friend or when you yourself are in a place where your anxiety and your depression is, is bothering your life, in other words, you can't live your life the way you want to live, then you've kind of gone overboard on that, right? Like you've, you're experiencing it in a way that can be dangerous. And we want to really be aware of that with one another. So in other words, we don't want to ever... We, we want to stay away from trying to fix each other. Like, oh, you should feel better. You should just, you know, you should do this, do that. We want to be cognizant of the fact that when we struggle with these kinds of mental health diagnoses, that people are more susceptible to self-harm, especially our younger people, okay? We've had, in the Denver church, we've probably had like five suicides in the last 20 years since I've been there of active members of the church. That's sad. Obviously, that's really difficult. One of the things I, when I do my workshops is um, I teach on a suicide protocol. Here's, here's my thinking, guys, on this one is 
in the DNA of, the, of our ICOC churches, our DNA is such that we're open with each other, right? Like our DNA says, open your heart up. Let's be really honest with one another, don't we? We study the Bible pe with people and we like, they open their lives up to us. Yeah, I committed adultery or all these different things. We dig deep with people. That's our DNA. It's really good. But it also, people at times will be really honest, say, I've thought about harming myself. And at that juncture, we cannot afford to simply accept that and be like, oh, let's just pray about that. We, we can't do that. That night, so I set up a protocol of people in churches to have a protocol that when that happens that night, the leader know where, knows where to go with it. Okay? We're not allowed in Denver. We're not allowed to hold on to that information. So if a teen worker is with a high school kid, for instance, and that high school kid says, yeah, I thought about harming myself, that teen worker is not allowed to hold on to that. He's not allowed to. He has to go up the chain to get to a person like me or one of the other professionals in the, in the church because we just can't. It, it's too dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so keep that in mind when you're in fellowship, you're talking to people. If they're saying things about that, please find a professional in your church Find the Ingalls, and if they need to, they'll, they'll track down a professional to get the help that they, that they need. <coughs> so that's one of the challenges, dangers. Another one is just distrust, isolation, and dis discouragement. You guys know that, right? People that struggle with mental health, man, they can get isolated. They get discouraged, disillusioned. They start seeing God that way. Like they struggle with their perception of who God is. We should be aware of that. We should make sure that we're really attending to them. And then finally, um, oh, I guess I took the other thing out. So these are just challenges and dangers of mental health. I want to make sure we, we have those warnings out there uh, to keep those in mind. Are there any questions up to this point? Yeah. How do you handle confidentiality issues within that? I mean, like, per se, when we're studying with people, I think there's maybe this unwritten rule that I'm going to respect the things that you're sharing with me. I mean, I, I kind of know, already know the answer, but can you kind of speak <laughs> sure. to how you're handling that? Sure. Like in a professional sense, we always do the disclaimer. Like everything we talk about is safe and confidential. All the ministries I run, that's a cornerstone of our ministries, is when you come, what you share is safe and confidential. We're not allowed to tell anybody about it, except the state of Colorado and all states harm to self, harm to others, or I'm currently being abused. So if those three things come up, then I, I'm not allowed to hold on to it. Now we do it relationally. So if you're studying the Bible with somebody and they bring that up, you, you do it relationally like, huh, okay, how can I get you some help tonight? What are your resources? And obviously, um, you know, the severity of it, that's why we set up protocol within a church to find out how severe is it. So I've had people call me at 10, 11 o'clock at night. This kid knows the safe, the combination of the gun safe, and we can't seem to talk him out of it. What do we do? That's severe, right? So that's when we call the police. The police go over there and they deal with it. Versus a kid that says, yeah, I thought about this last week. And nothing else happens, right? That's a, so we try to rate the severity of it. But harm to self, harm to others, or being abused. Those are the three things that we're not allowed to keep confidential. What I did in the past with people that I'm studying the Bible in a past, um, past professional form is I would ask somebody to stay with them overnight. Um, just so that they don't have Yeah. Schools are a great resource. I mean, in schools, the counselors have been trained. I've done hundreds of these things, so they're really good at helping parents with this. They're, they're a good resource. Obviously, private counseling is good, but on the moment, though, that's the biggest thing that I'm concerned about, is in that moment that we get the appropriate help. A lot of times, police, uh, police departments have a, a, like a liaison officer who's been trained that'll show up at the home. I mean, we've had police go to homes at like 2 a.m. for wellness checks. So they'll do it. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Anything else as far as like so far? 
guys are a quiet bunch tonight. Mm -hmm. it's heavy stuff. What's that? It's heavy stuff. Right? It is. Yeah, yeah. It's heavy stuff. Um, well, we're going to get some better stuff here in a minute, okay? But I, I do like to throw out the warning kind of thing because I don't take it lightly. Like, I've lost too many friends, and we've lost yeah. people in our church. So, okay. So, I have a question before yeah. we get on to the brain. Um, I learned that there is such a thing as a difference between stress and distress. Like stress can be motivating in terms of our personal growth, but distress is mm. demotivating. Yeah. Like it's overwhelming sort of distress. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's getting into the trauma thing. Like how much do we... Like on Sunday, I'm going to talk about this idea of how much we take into our bodies. Like social media, news, mm -hmm. trauma, other people's trauma. How much we expose ourselves to outside resources. Mm -hmm. And I don't think our bodies were made to do what we're doing these days. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I get on my phone in the morning and see all this news from Pakistan and places around the world. People I've never met before. I have no power over them, no power to help them. But I read about their trauma. And I just kind of soak it into my own. So how much we expose ourselves to is really important. So the irony of anxiety, it's kind of interesting to me. I don't know if this will be interesting to you or not, but it's interesting to me. There's an irony of anxiety. An iron, there, it's ironic in a sense. Because what's the purpose of anxiety? The God-given purpose of it? To keep us safe, right? It's to protect us, to keep us safe. But what happens, ironically is that it ends up doing the exact opposite to us. It ends up hurting us. It's ironic. So when I'm a little boy, there was this little red-headed girl, and I thought she was super cute, right? And um, so I really wanted to talk to her. But what was my body telling me? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it, Tim. You're an idiot. Don't do it. <laughs> so I didn't do it, right? And the very thing... I wanted to do, my body wouldn't let me do it. Mm -hmm. Later on, you're in a high school classroom and the guy's lecturing on and on and on and you're not getting it. What should you do? Ask a question. You should stop him and ask a question. What do you do? Nothing. You don't do anything. Because <laughs> your body says, don't say anything to him, you're an idiot, right? <laughs> Although half the class is thinking the exact same thing, but nobody's got the wherewithal to do it. So there's an irony behind anxiety is it actually hurts us when it's supposed to protect us and help us. And we should realize that. Like when, when anxiety comes up in my mind, I have to question it. Is this protecting me or is it going to end up hurting me? Is it going to cause me to back up in life when I could be doing something good? I used to get... Um, uh, what? Well, oh, shoot. I hate flying. And I made the mistake of reading about airplane crashes. <laughs> Not a good thing to do. Don't ever do that. And then I kept reading about it. And I read about people falling out of airplanes at seven miles in the air and what happens to them. And oh my gosh. I know, right? I just flew out here. I know. <laughs> what was I thinking? Um, but it almost caused me to quit flying. Now that's kind of stupid, isn't it? When you want to do something with your life, but then you quit flying when the statistics say it's safer to be in an airplane than it is to be on the ground. Did you know that? Yeah. You're actually safer in an airplane than you are anywhere on the ground. It's crazy. <laughs> Statistically speaking, I'm safer up there than I am sitting at home in my living room. Because at home in my living room, guys can crash through the door and shoot me, my house can burn down, whatever. Airplanes are very... <laughs> Airplanes are statistically very safe. Now, now I'm anxious. I know. It's my job. I know. That's my job. Now buy a book. You need me. There's another one, though, the paradox of anxiety. There's a paradox. You guys know what paradoxes are, right? You remember those um, Chinese finger, torture finger things? Yeah, yeah, you put your fingers in, and the more you pull, what happens? The tighter it gets, the more difficult it makes it. Here's the other thing about anxiety is the more you avoid it, the more difficult it becomes to overcome it. 
It's really interesting. Years ago, when anxiety first started kind of coming on the scene, we taught a lot of avoidance techniques to kids. We'd say, well, just learn to not be in that situation. Walk away from that situation. We taught them uh, anxiety avoidance techniques, and they made a lot of sense back then. Guess what? That's not a good thing to do. Because the more you avoid it, the more difficult it becomes to overcome it. When I was a little boy, every time I said, I ain't going to talk to that little cute redheaded girl. Every time I said it, guess what it made it harder to do next time? To go talk to her. Every time you decide not to raise your hand, it makes it more difficult to ever raise your hand again. The more you avoid anxiety, the more difficult it ever becomes to overcome it. So now we do, we talk about... Before you move yeah. On. It seems like you're correlating stress and anxiety. Like I, when you're talking, sometimes I think what you're saying is about stress and not necessarily anxiety. So can you define how you're differentiating the two? Yeah, I'm thinking anxiety in terms of um, kind of your self-talk um, when you're, especially situational anxiety or things that are problematic in your life going. And like stress seems to me to be, you know, sometimes we're stressful, sometimes we're not. You know, I had a bad day, car broke down. Anxiety is a little bit more like, a, in my mind, kind of a, a constant with us. We, we struggle with it, like on a consistent basis. So I am talking more about anxiety and situations that um, they can be, how do you say it, like personal in nature. They're not out there, they're more in here the way I think about myself. So talking to the little red-headed girl is you would consider more anxiety and not, not stress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's like statements I make about myself, even as a little kid. You're stupid, Tim. You're not very, you know, you don't know how to treat girls. Or there's these personal statements we make about ourselves. That, that to me is like the source of something like that. Does that answer that? I don't know if I could differentiate it yeah. the way, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, because with I that, still yeah. with what the, you guys are talking about, is the source <clears throat> the difference with stress? The source source of its cause different with stress versus anxiety versus trauma. Yeah, I, I, so I, I would think stress is more of like an external something's happened to me externally that's causing my boss is mad at me. I didn't get enough sleep last night. Whereas I look at anxiety, it's a little bit more like a personal, how I think about myself, how I've dealt historically with situations in my life. And then trauma is way, you know, trauma is those things that happened to us that never got resolved. Gotcha. And they still kick us around, like I said, Shane and Sarah, 65 years later, they still have a voice in my life. Okay. So what we do now is we teach anxiety conquering techniques. In other words, we teach people you've got to engage your anxiety. You cannot avoid it. I mean, you can, but it doesn't help you at all to avoid it. You're, you know, we teach kids at school, engage it, learn how to go into it. So there's some things I want to share with about that. You know, I can't change the direction of the wind, right? But I can always adjust my cells to reach my destinations. In other words, there are some things we don't get to change. There are some things we have no voice in. I don't get to decide who I work with very often. Don't get to decide my boss's mood. I don't get to decide my spouse's development in our marriage sometimes. You know what I'm saying? I don't get to tell my teenage kids how to behave sometimes. I mean, there's things outside of me that I have very little impact on. I do have impact on how I respond to things. That's the thing I can own, is how do I manage myself? So I can always adjust myself. So here's some things that, um, that I've been learning lately about anxiety. Number one is just listen to God. Like God, I was thinking the other day, I was mowing my lawn and it occurred to me, I'm gonna write a book called The 100 Ways That Science Catches Up to the Bible. Right? I was just thinking about some of these different things I've learned over the years about how science does something and everybody gets so excited about it. And I'm like, actually, that's in Ephesians chapter 4. I can show it to you. 
like cognitive behavioral therapy is a big the big thing out in counseling these days it's the big one i'm like paul did that in ephesians 4 17 through 19. he talks about the heart the mind and the behavior all being interchanged with one another i'm like he came up with that 2,000 years before Aaron Beck did. Okay, there's so many places in the scripture. There's this thing called, uh, in family counseling, it's called transgenerational theory. It's the big one. It basically says we pass our dysfunction from generations to generations. You guys know your grandma and how dysfunctional she was, right? You've heard those stories? <laughs> like, oh, your Uncle Bob. He was, you know. Like them, so. <laughs> what, what's that? I'm like my grandfather. Oh, you're not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. You know, it's, it's like we know our family lineage, right? We know like, oh, yeah, I'm, I've got my mom's control issues. And Old Testament, the sons will suffer the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. God talked about that thousands of years ago. We came up with it in the 1950s. Okay, so and we're all excited. It's good. You know, I just I just figure out any theory or anything that works well. You're probably going to find it in the scripture somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's fine. So some things God did years ago. He said, guys, take time every week just to disconnect. Just do it. He didn't tell us a lot about how to do it. He just said, just go do it. Don't work. Rest. Find joy with your family. Eat food. Just do it every week. He said for a whole day. We're seeing a lot of books on it now. Everybody's writing books on the Sabbath. Yay, go Sabbath. I'm like, God told us to do that a long time ago. <laughs> now what happened is the, you know, like some religious leaders got really into it and they started making it like laws. Like, all right, you're going to do the Sabbath? Here's 602 ways to do it. Don't do this to your donkey. Don't, do, you know, don't do all these things. And it just became this onerous, like, ugh. They even made it like a salvation issue. Jesus finally walks into the scene and goes, listen, guys, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. One sentence, he cleared it all up for us. He said, just do it so it works for you. You don't need to serve the Sabbath. Don't do all these laws. Just do it so it works for you. This is a big thing in our society right now, is people learning to take chunks of time to just be alone or be with your family without any, anything else going on. No errands. I love Joel P. his family. They've been doing Sabbath like for 20 years now. He said on Friday night, they'd get a huge cookie. They'd dump a thing of um, ice cream on top of it, and that's how they start their Sabbath yes. celebration. Every week, they've been doing it. <laughs> That's their thing. It's the most written about of the Ten Commandments. Most of the commandments are do not murder, like three words. This one has 108 words in it. Keep the Sabbath, and God does like 108 words. Let me tell you why to do it. All the other ones. All the other commandments were like, yep, that's right, don't steal, don't covet. But when you get to this one, they're like, ah, what that really means is... It's amazing, guys. I've been trying to do this for about a year and I'm a rookie at it. It's amazing what it's done for my soul just to whew, calm down. Throughout the week, not just that day, but just throughout the week, it's really helped me. Meditation, we're gonna talk about this on Sunday. How many people in here meditate? What are some of your experiences? I'm kind of curious about that with meditation, just good, bad, indifferent, Love it. Like what's come of it? Yeah, like how's it working out for you? I think it's helped me slow down my thinking process and be more aware of my thoughts in general. Like not just in the moment, but in general it makes me more aware of how I think and what I'm taking in. Sure. So when you're not meditating, mm -hmm. you notice a difference in your life. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. When I first started meditating, I fell asleep all the time. It was, it was hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I think that was... It, it was good. Like, and it was... It's fine. Um, no, it's what I need. I think it's what I needed. You know? And mm. now it's not as much. Now it, it helps to... Just in a lot of ways, actually. But 
It took it took a little bit to get over the sleeping curve. <laughs> <laughs> Just being honest. Yeah. It's that church on Sunday, like Shane, is he meditating or is he, or is he asleep? It's with that guy. I thought he was supposed to preach today. Thanks for sharing that. What else? Other experiences or goods, bads, helpful things? Uh, I found that, that it's like when I got into it, I was able to know what I was feeling. Because sometimes I think I feel a certain way, but that's not actually what's going on. So just slowing down and being like, mm. oh, that actually affected me, but I didn't think it did. Mm-hmm. It helps me to like put words into it, and then I'm able to act. On it, yeah. And I'm able to know. I become more aware of what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. I hear that a lot. Awareness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. You ever feel like you're just going through life unaware? Like what just happened the last week? I, I mean, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. Yeah. So I've heard people say prayer is a form of meditation. Is that is that correct, or is that? Uh, yeah, for sure. I I, I think so. Nobody praising. <laughs> well, but, 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 but is it? Is it like, <laughs> okay. Is, it, is meditation a conversation you have with yourself? Kind of you know, kind of like think about what's going on through prayer and stuff. And... Absolutely. Yeah. Somebody said, um, when we pray, we shouldn't invite God into this meeting because God's already here. Mm-hmm. Like, God's already pre- premiates. He's not like out the door, like, oh, good, they invited me in. <laughs> Come on in. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, yeah, it's, it's like He's already within all of, the, all of us. He's in this room. His Spirit works here. So I think in the same way, when we're praying... Um, yeah, I think about Paul in Romans, like the Spirit teaches us when, we, when we don't know what to pray. Sure. He utters for us, you know. So yeah, I, I, I think that's a really interesting point. I've never read anything on it, but it makes total sense to me. Oh, anybody else? I, I'll contribute. The, um, I'm not consistent with my meditation. I wish I could say that I was. But um, there's times when I cannot get focused for the life of me, and then there's other times where I like to do the cent- like the centering prayer, which I think is really an example of meditation and prayer. And um, that really helps me just kind of like get control of my thoughts because they're usually all over the place. And so then to just like really focus in on that form of prayer slash meditation. But there, more recently I was meditating and I just felt all of my system just kind of like you know, they say it lowers blood pressure and your heart rate and all that. I felt like I could feel that. And I got up and I felt refreshed, but I also just felt like my body was just like, like it could physically let down. And wow. I feel so um, scared. That's cool. Which Thanks. Which is also scared. <laughs> you guys, Diane, Diane is like, she's like one of my new heroes in life. <laughs> my wife came up. I said, you got to meet this woman, Diana. She's like, Kind of like a hippie, <laughs> but she's like really spiritual, and she totally changed my life with something that she did. You got to come meet her. So Jackie like, came up. She's a hippie without dressing like a hippie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you haven't seen all my work. Oh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> but she changed my life a year ago in something in a presence thing she did, and then she changed my wife's life this past summer. My wife came home and bought four hats like that. <laughs> Four of them. I'm like, yeah, they get four hats. She's like, yeah, that's what Diana wears. So my wife's got these hats. She walks around all the time. Um, you know, it's simple as you know. I always believe let's start real small and then just keep our foot in the door and keep growing. It's as simple as we're sitting on the couch a while back. My wife and I are watching this TV show, and she does those five horrible words. Honey, we need to talk. Like the five worst words for a male to hear, right? Your heart is beating. And usually when she does that, I would like turn to her and I'd be like, let's go, baby. You know, I'm, I'm kind of ready to go with you. You want to fight? I, I. And um, he said, wow, is that you? <laughs> you should have. 
it wasn't that dramatic. When I speak, I make things bigger. But but that's what I thought, kind of what I felt, my head, like, all right. And I just... What's up? <laughs> and it was wonderful. Like, guys, it just pulled me down. And we had a really decent talk. Like, she was more jacked up than I was. Because I've been learning just... Meditation is just this idea of... And we're going to see Jesus do it at the end of this little thing tonight. It's this idea of you just separate your anxious, defensive brain from your loving and logical brain. It's really what it does. It allows you to separate the parts of us that are always going, always working, always producing, and it gives us an opportunity to access a loving, logical, God-centered part of our lives. And it takes practice. Like I said, I'm a rookie at this stuff. It takes practice. It takes work. But it's changed the way I've approached my life. Like it's changed my anxiety in a big way. The final one here is um, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. We've all read that before. You know, you read that whole psalm, it's chaotic in that psalm. You keep reading it. It's like, why are the nations raging against one another? Like it's a chaotic psalm. And God says, you know what? Even in the midst of all that, be still and just know that I am God. So I read my newspaper in the morning, guys. It's chaos in our world. You know it. Gosh. It affects our souls. It affects who we are when we read this chaos, and it's never going to end. It's just where we live. It's just not. Our political system, I'm an independent, so it's not going to change. I don't care who's in office. It's going to be chaos. God says in the middle of that kind of stuff, just be still. Know that I'm God. Okay, I'll finish up here with a couple of thoughts. These are real practicals. So one of the things you know we teach is calming strategies. Learn to, uh, to do things to yourself that calm your body down. There's different things you can do, like body. You, you saw me just breathe. I just did two breaths. You all were laughing at me. I was trying to stay centered with my breaths. And Sarah's over there giggling and stuff. And, you know... Um, but that's one of the best practices we can do, guys. We actually, in my school district that I used to work for, um, we hired a woman to come in, full-time woman, to come in and teach teachers how to do meditation in the classroom setting. Public schools, big, big district. And that's one thing she did. She teach teachers how to get their kids to learn breathing techniques. They're not hard to do. They're really not. They just take some practice. Um, Stretching, that's another one. You know, we can try this real quick if you want to. Um, just, you know, sit in your chair for a second and um, just clench every muscle in your body as hard as you can and then hold it for about 20 seconds. Okay, ready? Go. And now just kind of slowly, slowly just let it go. feel better? I feel better. It kind of loosens me up. Stretching exercises also just, you know, you know taking time just to uh, stretch your back out. If, if you work at a desk, you know, get up, walk around a little bit. Mind, mindfulness. Um, we started praying when we pray for our dinners at night sometimes. We'll just pray and thank God for all the Grocery store workers, the guys and girls that deliver the stuff in the truck. We pray and thank God for the farmers that made these crops, the people that were instrumental in the gasoline. I mean, we just mindfully go through all the different people that were involved in putting this thing on our table. I've even thanked the cows before. Like, God, thanks for that cow. Like, God gave his life up for me, man. <laughs> You're looking at me like, yeah, God does eat a lot of cow, doesn't he? Um, yeah, my wife's a vegan. That's been interesting. Um, but mindfulness can be really good. Just thinking through, like, what, 
how did this happen? Like, how did this house even happen? Like, men and women kind of sacrifice and work to build this thing. It's not just, you know, there's design behind it. People had to think through. There's historical um, architecture behind this home here. These things didn't just pop up. Like, over centuries, these things develop. It's really interesting just to take your mind and let it go to how did God work in these areas? Um, humor is good. Jesus was super humorous, you guys. I don't care what anybody says. I'll argue this till the day is gone. But the Bible didn't say anything about him being humorous, but it's all throughout the scriptures. The guy could crack a joke. He was coy. Like he was really good at like, like helping people laugh at themselves. Use humor. It's a great technique to calm your body down. Um, senses, music, lotion, scent, those are good. Candles, my wife's got all these candles everywhere in the house. Um, she'll burn it down someday. <laughs> Some people journal. Somebody once said, what I don't journal, I take out on my family. We just gave away, my wife had so many journals, we filled this big suitcase up with them. She's like, I want to get rid of these. So I filled a suitcase, a big suitcase like that, put it out in the garage for about two weeks. I said, are you sure you want to get rid of them? She's like, yep. So we threw them all out in the trash. It's amazing. Like, she journals all the time. If you're good at journaling, keep doing it. If you're not good at journaling, try it a little bit more. What you can put down on paper, sometimes it gets out of your body. And then venting. Um, we used to have a thing in our house. When we come home from work, we each get about 15 minutes to vent the day. So Jackie would go. All right, so I learned all about her crazy workmates. And then I would go and talk about all these crazy kids I work with. And they were like, we're done for the evening. No more work. Like, we're done. I'd go into my colleague's office, sit down, close the door. I said, dude, I just got to tell you a couple things that are going on right now. Just venting. Sometimes just unloading, getting rid of stuff, get it off your plate, and then be done with it. But I want to close out with a couple thoughts about Jesus doing this, okay? So I want to just close out. Jesus, somebody said last week in communion, they said, God squeezed himself into a man. That's Jesus. Jesus is perfect. If you want to know anything about God that you don't know about God, like if, if you're like, how did God do that? Just look at the life of Jesus. Sometimes I look at God like, I don't got it. I don't get it, God. And then I look at Jesus, I go, oh, now I get it. He perfectly exampled everything God is. Okay, so here's a situation in John chapter 8. Jesus is going along, and the Pharisees, the religious guys, they, they planned to get a woman caught in adultery. They planned it. And so they set it up. It's a big setup. So they find this woman, and they, they set her up, and she gets caught, and they planned it all out. And they grab this woman, and they throw her down. And they said, Jesus, this woman's caught in the act of adultery. The law says we should stone these women. What do you say? Now think about this for just a moment. Here's Jesus going along his life, trying to do his thing. And all of a sudden, this happens to him. Think about the three challenges. He had three major challenges that got presented within an instant. Number one, he had a woman who he needed to have compassion on. This woman was, was uh, brutally traumatized by these men. Okay, She was thrust in a position that was probably, you know, in those days women didn't get to earn livings very well. I mean, she was being exposed to a bunch of men. This woman was hurting in a big way. So he had that challenge in front of her. Then he had the challenge of a law that he had written. He had written the Old Testament law that said, stone such women. He wrote that thing. And then thirdly, he had a group of religious men who he needed to help with their self-righteousness. He loved those guys. Those were not his enemies. He loved those men. He came to die for those men. So he had three things that came up in his life, right? Now, he could have done a lot of things. He could have, like, gone in and just rebuked the woman, like, what were you thinking, woman? Get back and never do that again. He could have done that. He could have done a really confusing, 
litany of, of things about the law, like really confuse everybody with theology, and everybody walked away like, what was, he what was he talking about there? I don't get it. Or he could have just hammered the, the Pharisee guys. He didn't do any of those things. What did he do? He bends over, and he starts doodling in the dirt. <laughs> He just bends over like he just like could you imagine like this super tense situation and what's he do he just gets on the ground and he starts playing in the dirt somehow doesn't say that he wrote anything he wrote something but doesn't say anything like it was words or not and then he gets up and he asks one question and then he got down on his knees and did it again the Bible says he did it twice I believe what Jesus was doing was buying himself space. He was 100% human. He had all the weaknesses you and I have. I believe what he was doing was he had to buy himself some space. And so he did what worked for him. He bent down and he spent some time on the ground. He gets up and he goes, which one of you guys haven't sinned yet? And what's the Bible say about that statement? What do the guys do? The oldest, the oldest. Yeah, the oldest guys right away, like, yep, busted, big time, right? I'm out. Yeah, I'm out. And then the young guys are standing there like, ah, ah, and then they drop their rocks. Then he bends over again, and then he gets up and he asks a second question. He asks a woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Then neither do I. He solved all three of his problems in two questions. He had compassion on a woman who desperately needed compassion. He was able to show that the law was written not for, um, just, uh, for judgment, but for mercy. It was written to be merciful on people. And number three, he was able to help those self-righteous guys walk away and go, <sighs> you see, Jesus perfectly embodies how to buy space. He did it. He didn't have to do that. But he was human. And so he took care of himself in that way. He bought himself some space. So why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so, so disturbed within me? Ask yourself questions, guys. Challenge your inner, your inner anxiety at times. Um, here's another thing as I end up is argue with yourself. So I had to do this on the airplane, right? I had to learn to argue with myself. Tim, don't get on that stupid airplane. There's like a half an inch of metal between you and seven miles of space below you. That's what I would be saying to myself once I get on the airplane. Don't do it. Stupid, right? So I have to argue with myself. One of the things you can do to argue with yourself is do consequences versus rewards. So I'd, I'd, I'd sit here and go, okay, wait a minute. I really want to fly to this city so I can do my workshops. That's a reward. It's meaningful to me. What's the consequence? Well, one out of, you know, I don't know what the stats are, 16 million, something, 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 chances that the airplane's going to crash. So I did a cost-benefit analysis, right? When I was five years old, I should have gone ahead and said, Tim, she's really cute. Just go ahead and say something to her. What's the worst thing that's going to happen to you, right? So argue with yourself. What's the risk versus the reward? Sometimes negotiating exposure. That just means give yourself a little bit of that dangerous stuff in front of you. Well, just a little bit. They do this with snakes, right? Somebody's scared of snakes, so what do they do? They don't bring a big boa constrictor in and like put it in front of you. What do they do? They bring a little plastic snake and they'll put it on the ground in front of you. Like just a little plastic thing. You know it's plastic, you can kick it. No big deal. We expose a little bit of the danger to you. And then the next day, what do they do? You know, a bigger one, a rubbery one. And then after the rubbery one, then maybe a real one, right? So if you expose yourself to a little bit of your anxiety, little by little, you can learn to tolerate more. And then sometimes we just have to appeal to our courage and our morals, values. I was talking to some guy the other day. Oh, yeah, brother. He's telling me how he got met to become a Christian. Some guy just walked up to him at the airline counter. He's an airline guy. He just walks up and invites him to church. Remember those days? I don't know about you. Maybe you're one of those special people. But for me, that was terrifying to do that. Door knocking's terrifying for me. Okay? 
just randomly inviting people. I used to have a big stuttering problem, and to randomly invite people was terrifying to me. But I would always have to appeal to my courage, to my values. I'm going to push through this because it's important to me. So sometimes that's one of the ways you overcome anxiety, is just appealing to a higher calling in your life. I love this quote, the best stories are not those of victory over struggles, but of a stubborn faith in the midst of them. In our ministries, we always tell the leaders, don't stand up and go, hey, look at me. Look at the way I've overcome my stuff. Don't do that. You're not the focus of this ministry. I said, what I want you guys to do is be in front of people as a model of recovery. Go up there and tell them where you're in the middle of it. That inspires me. The guys that have already overcome don't inspire me much. I'm like, yeah, good for you. <laughs> Knock yourself out. I love the people that stand there and go, I'm right thick in the middle of it. Paul said that you've seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of it. Paul is a great model for that. So that inspires me. I'll end up with this. They're like, you said that 10 minutes ago. How many, and how many times are you going to end up with something? I, I start off tonight talking about this. The church is, I think, the perfect place. Not the only place for healing, but I think it's perfect. And there's some reasons why. First of all, it can be safe and confidential. Please do that in your relationships with one another. Please keep things safe and confidential as you're able to. Please don't ask your disciple or person to get advice about somebody they, if they know who you're talking about. Don't do that unless you get permission. So I always ask permission. Do you mind if I get some help on this? But never do that without permission. Unless it's harm to self, harm to others, being abused. We're accepted at church. Guys, I don't know. Look around your church on Sunday. We're, we're accepted. It doesn't matter who you are, right? Anybody can come to this church. Everybody should be accepted. If that's not true in your group, make sure it happens. We should all be accepted. As a matter of fact, Paul said the people that are most in the worldly, worldly eyes, the most challenged among us, he said, those people are indispensable to me. 1 Corinthians 12, read it. He said, the church is made up of indispensable people that the world has kind of cast aside. So no matter where you are in life, you're accepted in our church. You're cared for, right? You got people that care for you. We have a purpose, right? Never forget the morning I woke up, I had gotten a did a bunch of drugs the night before. I got kicked out of a concert. A guy threw me through a door, broke my shoulder. I woke up. I'm in the kitchen of my mom and dad's house. I'm throwing up in the sink. I heard a knock on the door, and I heard, and I thought to myself, this is the worst day of my life. The only thing that would make it worse, if that's Mike Hayes, invite me to that stupid Bible study group. And I went and looked out the window, and it was Mike Hayes at the door, knocking on my door. <laughs> The guy had purpose. I didn't answer the door that day, by the way. <laughs> um, but when I finally came to a place where I'm like, I need to know God. Mike, hey Mike, hey Mike, 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 this is Tim. We have purpose that goes way beyond ourselves, right? So remember that. You're an important piece of your church. And then finally, guys, listen to one another. Um, <laughs> you're like, how many slides does he have jeez <laughs> exercise and sleep just reminders exercise and sleep thought records if you ever want to overcome a thought in your life google the word thought record it's a really nice journaling way to overcome thoughts just by writing them down and writing a couple pieces on there shape your environment i get in my car i don't turn on talk radio anymore or very little if you're an alcoholic don't get a job in a bar <laughs> Just don't. Just like the things you can control, control those things. Shape your environment. Stay socially connected. Nurture a dream. No matter where you are in our recovery ministries, we always tell people, have something bigger than you going on. No matter where you are in recovery. Nurture something that's bigger than you are. Keep in mind resources. You can always Google like Anchorage. Mental health. Um, if you're in the campus group, campus counseling, a lot of our public institutions have free counseling. Um, check your insurance. 
There's a great book called Lost Connections. Has anybody read Lost Connections? Johan Hari. Great book. This guy's amazing. He um, he wanted he he. It's not a Christian book. He's he struggles with depression. He's a writer. He's a journalist. These are New York Times bestseller. He traveled the world to research how do other countries do mental health, because in America we're a, um, we're like a pharmacy medication first thinkers. We think first medication. So he went to all these other countries and talked to their mental health people. And what he found out was everybody else does it differently than we do. And he came up with like nine connection points to, re to resolve mental health in your life. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. he do a TED Talk? I'm sure he did, yeah. Was the shaman was the different? I'm not sure. He wrote another book called Chasing the Scream. It's about drug abuse. Mm -hmm. He kind of takes things and he flips them on their head. And he really challenges the American way of looking at it. Very famous. But Lost Connection is all about depression and anxiety. Um, and they're real simple connection points that we just don't think much about. Socially connected, community involvement, things like that. Anyways, um, that's a good book if you're ever interested in kind of diving in. There you go. How about that? I got books for sale if you want to buy a book. <laughs> Come on up and buy a book. Are there any questions you guys have? Any thoughts or? I have a question. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've learned about different things. I'm, I'm not a professional in, the, in, the, in any kind of field of uh, therapy. And so, this is cool stuff. I think I've learned stuff about myself. Sometimes, where is that line where I, you know, I don't want to do something that's harmful to somebody. Mm. Um, it, it's just kind of a gray area. And then the other part of it is, I think it's common, you know, people got to be open to this. And sometimes people are ready for it. That's like that what I conclude and I'm trying to, you know, so you can't make somebody, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and there has been a culture of, you know, we got to help, we got to help, we got to help, almost overboard. I've, I've learned that, you know, that, that things are changing and in a healthy way. That, sure. So I, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm an amateur psychologist, you know, I mean, I learn these things. Yeah. But I don't want to do something that gets, gets somebody in trouble. Sure. So that fear is part of the fear. Yeah. No, I appreciate that, that humility. No, it's good. I don't either. Like, <laughs> seriously, I, I get involved in people. I'm like, this is way over my head. I tell people all the time, I'm not enough for you. Just to let you know, I'm not enough for you. Um, so I think about a couple things that can be helpful. You know, obviously, when something's affecting a person, that their life's being interrupted, then it's problematic. There are certain things that are just quirks in our life, right? Like when I walk around, if I see a bunch of balloons, I have to hit each one. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Or my, ev on my desk, everything's at a right angle perfectly. Those are just quirks. They're not problematic to me. But there are things in my life that are problematic. And that's when I know I need professional help. Or I need something at least beyond myself. And probably beyond my discipler guy. So when life is problematic and people aren't doing life well, they're missing work, they're not treating their spouse very well, they're not treating their children well, that means it's problematic and they probably need something higher or more professional eyes than we have. So I tell people that all the time about their lives. The other thing is I tell them, even if I do know how to help you, I'm still not enough. Because it's not just my professional part, there's a social side of it. There's an emotional side of your life. There's mentoring. There's all sorts of things. So one thing I do think about is, you know, that's why I think churches are great because we do have a lot of people. Our old model was, I'm your discipler, so I'm going to tell you what to do to fix your life. And if you just do what I tell you to do, then you're going to be okay, right? That's the old model. How did that work out, right? It's like not good. Um, one, one time in our church, like, 30 years ago, they are like, yeah, this isn't working. So then everybody got assigned like four people. Oh, yeah. So you were my 
you're my financial guy, you're going to be my, you know, my marriage person, you're, you know, and then I'd have to go to each person, okay, it's my marriage, okay, I'll talk to you about that, and yeah. my finances, I'll talk to you, and then it got all these crosses going on. <laughs> so, um, so I do tell people, like, let's think resources, like, what are the resources available out there? There's a lot of different resources. Um, so suggesting books for people to read are, is a really good thing. Books are amazing, guys. For 15 bucks, you can sit down at the foot of, a, of an expert and, and learn. Like, you're learning from the, one of the best people out there on that topic. So books are great. Um, I think we don't use our scriptures very well. I think we've gotten to a point where I don't see people opening Bibles up in fellowship as the way we used to. The scriptures, you guys, you guys know this, but I mean, they're just deep. And the Psalms are wonderful places to go to help people identify or at least relate to their feelings. Like, okay, I get this. Like, God's with me on this. He's, he put these Psalms in here so I could identify with these emotions that I have. So I think using scriptures can be really helpful. Um, but we do what we can do, and then we, we pass it on to other people that are more experts in it. I was talking to my doctor the other day. I went in for this pre-operation thing, and um, oh, I'm not going to tell you this story. Never mind. <laughs> There's a question back here. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, oh. Josh. Hey, Josh. Oh, how do you, like, I, I feel like the line between a moral and a legal obligation gets mm. blurred mm. a lot. Because, you know, there, there are times where I think it's good in the moment to send somebody to, like, a hospital or, like, call the police. Yeah. It's bad in the long run. <clears throat> mm. And so at what point do you try to figure out what would be better? Yeah. That's a good question, bud. Mm -hmm. Really good and deep. I love it when teenagers... <laughs> think really thoughtful questions and have enough courage to actually ask them. There you go. Here's the thing I think, Josh, is I, I think in the middle of a car accident is a lousy time to put on a seatbelt. You're like, what's he talking about? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like when you're in a car accident, you don't want to be reaching for a seatbelt at that moment because it's too dangerous to try to do that. So when somebody's talking to me about harming themselves that's going to be permanent I don't have a luxury to be like yeah maybe he's just I just don't it's not like a luxury I get to enjoy at that moment it's one of those things where I'm like yeah I was watching uh, Mission Impossible on the way up here on a plane you guys see Mission Impossible the last scene he's standing like at the edge of this cliff there's like 80 miles below him and I just my gut was like in turmoil because he's so close to the edge that one slip and he's gone so Josh I do think there's times where we just have to protect one another because it's just so dangerous so I know it's hard like it was hard on some of my some of the people I've had to help out it's really hard at the time you know what though every in my job every student I ever had to help out when it was really hard we always made up afterwards like it always worked out afterwards. It might have taken months or even a year or two to kind of get hooked up again together and be okay with each other. But at the time it was horrible. Like they were F-bombing me and <laughs> I hate you, you're an idiot, you know. But I just did what I thought was right. So I think we got to do that with each other sometimes when it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see how you could understand that. But you're also talking about teaching people how to like, it was the, um, the protocol Yeah. To teach somebody to not overreact. Because yeah. you yourself may understand that, oh, yeah, you know, there's a difference between a person saying, oh, I'm thinking of hurting myself, and there's the person who's sure. going to hurt myself when I go home. And yeah, somebody yeah. somebody who doesn't have, like, experience under that kind of situational pressure. Sure. Like, how do you teach that person to not jump straight to, oh, i got to send this person. To yeah, yeah. That's a that's a good part two of the question. So that's where we get professionals involved. That's like when I tell churches to do that. Like like a guy like Shane may not be trained enough to actually at that level. For example, so but I, I'd say Shane find 
find a guy that is trained enough. Like find a professional that uh, that's yeah. what they do. How you doing, friend? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I get those calls. But so yeah, sometimes when those really important things, like do we send them to a hospital or we just send them home to mom and dad, right? That's where people that have seen it a hundred times can say, yeah, this sounds like send them home to mom and dad, he's gonna be fine. And you know, Josh, sometimes we made the wrong call too, but I always would rather make the wrong call on a safety side than to not make, you know, to, to mess up. So great questions though. In the, situ the situation that Josh is mentioning, would you, like, if they say they're going to harm themselves, it, you know, if they were saying, I'm going to commit suicide, then you ask them, well, how are you going to do it to find out how seriously they are thinking of mm -hmm. it? But also with harming, could you do, like, the same thing? To, it's like, how are you going to harm yourself? Do you have the tools to do that? Yeah. So we always do, like, an assessment. We ask a lot of questions. Yeah. And we're just trying to ascertain, like, where are we on this thing? Yeah. And I know, um, just a second, Zuna. I know, I had a situation where a sister was really interested, I mean, she was really depressed, and she, um, she was suicidal, but she didn't necessarily have a method. And somehow I managed to get her in the car and go for a ride, and my plan was to take her to the emergency room at mm -hmm. the mental hospital because... I did not want her death on my hands. Yeah. And she, I mean, she didn't really <coughs> like that, but once she was in a moving car, she wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I tell, I, I teach uh, graduate level counselors, and I always tell them, do you want to go to bed at night thinking about this stuff? Yeah. And I've, I've had too many times I've gone to bed thinking, oh man, I should have, you know. So, it's a, it's a big, a big conversation, and we certainly have more of it. Yeah. So that part and kind of touches on what David was talking about of not wanting to cause harm. Like, uh -huh. how do you handle that taking in information? Sure. To be able to deal, I guess. Yeah. yeah. For it not keeping you up at night. Sure. Or the replaying of conversations of, oh, maybe I should have said this instead of this. Or, yeah. Any advice on yeah, I mean, I always, I always I err toward caution. Yeah. I just do because the consequences are too great. Right. So I always err toward caution, and and if it's long term, like if it's something that a friend of yours that's been like this consistently, then definitely that message of I'm not enough for you. You're speaking to the wrong person here. I can support you. I, I'll walk with you. I'll cry with you. I'll pray with you. There's things I can do to help you, but what you're sharing with me is way beyond me. And um, have you called your insurance company about this? Do you, does your wife know about this? Do you, you start bringing in a lot of other resources. Somebody once said, the bigger the problem is, the wider the social circle needs to be. Mm -hmm. So the bigger this, the more this guy's talking about things and, you know, threatening and um, I was abused as a child and, you know, this trauma happened to me and, and I, I have a gun and I've actually pulled it out of the drawer the other day to look at it. The bigger those things get, the more people we bring in, the wider the circle needs to be. And I do that, again, I do it a lot, guys. I just, I don't feel like I'm enough for some of these issues. So I bring in as many resources as I possibly can. I think you had a well, question. I mean, I'm a nurse and I deal with the physical emergencies. Mm. And I guess my, I mean, I don't, and you Please correct me if it's wrong. Like when somebody's not appears to not be breathing, or they're having a cardiac event, and you jump on your, their chest and you realize you just broke all their ribs, you kind of, I mean, I kind of maybe that's like a parallel thought. Like at the time, you you're just think you're you're going with the resources and the situation that you have. And then you have this, what we call post-resuscitation care, where you kind of analyze, well, what do we do, do now? And I don't know, it just made me think of that. And then I also work in an area where, like you're saying, I, I'm not trained to intubate people, and I'm not going to pretend like mm -hmm. I am, so I got to get my yeah. anesthesia provider there now. 
to do that intubation because that's a life or death kind right, of thing. Right. So I guess as you're talking, I'm just sort of likening some of these situations to the physical emergencies. And like, we don't have crystal balls ever, like when we resuscitate someone to know what their outcome's gonna be. Right. But we know that we have to act yeah. in that moment because if mm -hmm. we don't, we know what the outcome's yeah. gonna be if we don't. I don't know if that makes sense. So like in professional, like for counseling, they, we, we have a thing, if you act in good faith, you're okay. So if I overdo something, like if I call the if I call an ambulance and it turns out I made a bad professional choice, as long as I act in good faith, I'm I'm legally and I'm even morally I'm okay. So if you're acting in good faith, if you pull over the side of the highway and somebody get hit by a car, you pull over to help them. Most states will protect you for just doing your best, even if you did something stupid, right? Like even if you, as long as you act within your professional bounds, that's why I'm saying, guys, in our church, we got to be careful that we don't act outside of our professional bounds. That we 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 access the the needed resource, so you do go get that anesthesiologist that knows what they're doing because you're not trained in that area. So you at least go get that person to come in and do their thing. So I'm just saying, when somebody's when somebody's sharing self harm. That's outside of most of our, it's outside of our legal or outside of our knowledgeable bounds. But to, but to judge and say, yeah, I think they're okay or they're, they're just talking. I don't think it's fair to them. I don't. And so that's where I would want to access somebody to get their eyes on it. And that's what people do with me. They call me, go, Tim, put your eyes on this. And they tell me the story. Then I'm like, okay, here's what I know so far is here or here, you know, like what level is it? Does that make sense? It does. I think it's just like so much easier to do it with like a choking person. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I want you to be my nurse. I, oh, I think I do want you to be my. I think I do want you to be my nurse. Yeah, she's a nurse. Is she? Yeah, I thought she was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because sometimes we want it to be like really black and white. Yeah, and it's not. It's not. I, yeah. I just wanted to say maybe ending on a positive note. Just like, and I think some of this is just like thinking about the societal trends that mm -hmm. I feel like us being more aware of our mental health journey is a positive thing mm -hmm. because we're, we're, we have a chance to overcome, you know, generational traumas. Like, and it's tough, it's, it's hard, it's messy. But we have got a chance for hope, and I just yep. feel like that. I just feel like it's a, it's, a, you know, it's like Jesus coming of the age. Like it's like it's it's God is making things new, mm -hmm. and I feel like we have a chance. So I think it's t it's scary and tough, but I feel like it's encouraging that we're we're growing in this way. Yep, yeah. Yeah. that's a really good way to end this. So yeah, that's what I was thinking maybe we could think. About so a little. This little Elsa. Elsa was born in our not in our home, but when the kids lived with us, she was born. And so we had her for two plus years. My wife was her full-time caretaker. The kids lived in the basement during the pandemic. And I watched my daughter parent this little monster. <laughs> and she is doing such a better job than I am. Like, I did what I thought was best. Like, I really did when I raised my kids. But we had like two books to read back then. <laughs> There was like one avenue and you just did what that avenue because that's all that was out there. You're right. They're doing way better than her than we did. And I acknowledge that. And I think you're right. I think as we take on like this self-awareness, we're willing to go look at trauma that other people, society said, you know, you're not allowed to do that. We're like, yeah, I do. I, I am. When we do that kind of thing, the next generation really benefits. I really believe that. And I've just seen, you know, a couple of years of that with little Elsa, and she's so much just better. I was changing her diaper the other day. She blew one out, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've changed a lot of diapers, not one like this. And when I got done with her, she goes, thank you for changing my diaper, diaper, pop, pop. <laughs> she thanked me for changing her diaper. I never remember my kids doing that. I just thought, <laughs> I thought you guys are doing a good job with that little little squirt so um
but I think that's a really good way to end. I, I, I think we are a generation now that are benefiting from a lot of information. And, and the cool thing, guys, for me as a Christian, like that's just, I was out in Shane's neighborhood just praying today, long prayer walk, and I said, God, thank you for, for this space you've developed in my life as an older person, this space to really think through my life and um, space to consider trauma that I had as a kid, how you're healing it, because I don't have to pass this on as much as my, my dad had to, you know, and... Um, so we're taking, I think as Christians, we can really take advantage of like God's hand in all this as well. Mm-hmm. And I think our future generations, I think in our churches, you guys, our churches can radically change some dynamics from what you and I are used to mm-hmm. for this Generation Z or whoever they are these days. <laughs> I mean, can't keep up with them anymore, but, you know, can really change it for them. So they're, they're just living a more holistic life, a healthier life mm-hmm. in that way, so... Guys, thanks so much for all the questions. I feel really uh, um, connected to you. And I'm going to stick around tonight if you want to talk or if you want to buy a book or something. <laughs> I just don't want to haul these things back to, to Denver with me. But, um, but anyways, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks for your question. Yeah, it's good. I appreciate your... Just one uh, quick announcement. The party will continue tomorrow at mm. our house. Uh, it's at 5.30, but um, we're going to uh, serve some food, so if you are planning on coming, just give a, head, give a heads up, please, so that we have enough um, yum-yums for everybody. Oh, tomorrow night is um, Insights of a 12-Year-Old. Yes. Yeah, sure. it's going to be cool. It's Jesus as a 12-Year-Old boy, his ability to listen to people and to ask questions mm-hmm. at age 12. So we, 12-year-olds. So it's all about kind of like how do we um, connect to each other? How do we build good conversation with one another? Yeah, it's going to be good. It's one of my favorite things to do. It sounds fun. It's a great perspective. It is. The Bible says his parents were astonished at him. Like they were like just blown away. Like what is going on with this kid? 12 years old. Yeah. So I can do anything, like, fully open. I've been there as well, yeah. So they're all good, I mean. Well, you gotta, after this converts, you gotta put it in the right spot. You gotta get the, the audio off of this, I gotta get the video off of this, because otherwise everything fills up. 
so you, you recorded it on Zoom and on here? Oh, I hear go get a blanket. And then we typically keep it under our shirt. Did I get it? I don't know. I didn't feel anything. Put the baby to mom. Did you get it? Put the mom's also really on the body. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. I also have one bite. Bless you. How many came here? Oh, He's got to stay open. What'd you say? He's got to stay open.